Iconic wrestling coach Dan Gable once said, pain is nothing compared to what it feels like to quit. Give everything you've got today for tomorrow may never come. Gable could be describing those whose achievements have earned them the honor of being inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. Etched in Stone, the stories of wrestling's legends will take you inside the lives of over 200 of the greatest wrestlers in history as they share their never-before-told stories about their trials, tribulations, and triumphs. Competitors, coaches, teammates, and those who knew these athletes best will also weigh in on their accomplishments with their own unique perspectives. Welcome to the show, folks. You're listening to The Smiths on the Etched in Stone series. My name is Ryan Warner. I'll be your host. So let's get started. We're back with you here from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, as we move on to 158 pounds and, of course, Pat Smith. He has a possibility of being the first wrestler ever to win four national titles. Nobody's ever done it. Four in NCAA Division I national titles. It's, a, it's something that's been uh, sought after and not found. And again, Pat Smith to win tonight would become the first four-time NCAA wrestling champion in Division I history. His opponent is Sean Borman out of Michigan. Borman, a senior from New Lenox, Illinois, the number two seed. He has a 1994 record of 33-1. and one. Pat Smith is going to be a man on a mission tonight. Watching right before the match, uh, John Smith and Mark Perry uh, giving him a little bit of a word of advice, and you could tell by the way that Pat Smith responded that uh, he means business tonight, and he's going out there and uh, doing the best that he can to win this fourth title. And also on the other side, Bor- Borman is uh, going to come after Pat and not give him any respect. John Smith. John Smith. John Smith. Probably the greatest wrestler we've ever had in the United States. He took him down. I see a bundle of intensity. I find a way to win. Seems Jenner, Jenner. incredible that a family can do that well. Three NCAA champions, the only family to ever do that. It just seems one brother after the other tries to outdo the one before him. A big win for young Pat Smith. Pat Smith, the number one seed and defending champ from Oklahoma State. It was, you know, a wrestling life. You're listening to The Smiths, Episode 7. Let's get started. Now, in this episode, we follow Pat Smith as he attempts to become the first wrestler to win four NCAA Division I national titles. And we pick up our story in the fall of 1992. John Smith has just returned from the Olympics and has been named the head wrestling coach at Oklahoma State. But I'm looking forward to the opportunity to being able to help athletes achieve, not what I have achieved, but achieve their dreams and goals. Whether that be an All-American in in college, whether that be a national champion, whether that be an Olympic champion. I'm dealing with athletes that have those goals on all different levels. A few weeks later, the NCAA announced that they were ready to sanction Oklahoma State for the recruiting infractions. It was a day that Cowboy fans would never forget. Inside room 101, at the Center for International Trade Development, John Smith listened to a teleconference as the NCAA Director of Enforcement read the sanctions. The Cowboys are barred from competing at this season's NCAA Championship Tournament. Athletic scholarships have also been nixed for the next two seasons. And one of the harshest penalties in recent times, the Cowboys were prohibited from competing at the 1993 NCAA tournament. Pat Smith was sitting in the sports information office when he heard the news. And that's when they laid down a boom on us and, you know, told us we couldn't compete the next year at the NCAA tournament. And that was our punishment which at that time, that was kind of like a death penalty. Cowboy fans were enraged. I was stunned, devastated, uh, never expected it to be that bad. That's Willie Baker, an attorney based in Stillwater. Did the punishment fit the crime in your eyes? No, it did not. And uh, it, it just, what a void just to know that, hey, we're not going to get a chance to go compete. We've always had, in, in the time I've been around OSU, I went to school here 65 to 69, we've always had wrestlers competing in the NCAA tournament. Uh, and, uh, I mean, 
all Americans at a minimum, if not a national champ or two, and competing for championships, and just to not to be able to go at all. It was heartbreaking for Cowboy fans. But what did all this mean for Pat? After all, he was a senior and on the verge of making history by becoming the first wrestler to win four NCAA Division I titles. Well, the NCAA gave him a choice. He could transfer to another school and wrestle that season or redshirt. I didn't want to redshirt it. You know, I didn't want to set out a year. I didn't, that was, that did not appeal to me at all. I want to, I want, I don't want to sit out another year. Um, and you know, a little bit of it had to do with the fact that I was a little worried, a little worried that, you know, I got momentum. I don't want to stop for a year. This is important. I'm on a row. I want to keep it going. Um, and just setting out a year, and I wasn't familiar with setting out, you know, red shirt or anything like that, obviously. So I was just worried about losing momentum. So Pat decided to test the transfer waters and called his brother Leroy, who is the head coach at Arizona State. I called Leroy, and Leroy was, you know, real good with me. He said, well, think about it. Think about it. Um, you know, make sure this is the right decision. You make the right decision here because... Um, you know, you can't turn back if you do. So um, I did think about it. I talked to John a lot about it. Can you imagine the fear that Pat felt walking into John's office to tell his brother that he was going to transfer? Well, I knew he wasn't leaving. <laughs> I knew my brother was trying to get him. <laughs> so um, I don't know what Leroy said about it, but I remember it. Um, he wasn't going anywhere. So John, not one to mince words, asked Pat point blank, do you want to win three titles at Oklahoma State and one at Arizona State? Or is it more important to you to win them all at Oklahoma State? And right there I knew. I want to win them all at Oklahoma State. You're right. I need to stay here. I'm a cowboy. I'm a cowboy for life. I don't need to break this up. And I need to stay and I need to finish out. With Pat's commitment to stay in Stillwater, other wrestlers did the same. Like Alan Freed, who was one of the top wrestlers in the country at the time. But unlike Pat, Alan had already used his red shirt and was forced to burn one of his four precious years of eligibility to remain a cowboy. The one guy I do admire more than anybody during that time was Alan Freed. I really admired Alan Freed and the commitment that he made to Oklahoma State. And I'll be honest with you, I was very surprised that he did it. Um, and the only reason why I say that, say that is I don't know if I could have done it. You know, learn, burn a year just to stay. For head coach John Smith, Alan and Pat's commitment to stay was huge. I'm really loyal to those guys that stayed, you know, like Pat and, you know, um, Alan Freed, who actually gave up a year, you know. Um, those guys were were real important for us to be able to bounce back immediately or, or take a hit for six, seven years and trying to bring something back, you know. So um, those guys always need to be recognized as true cowboys, you know. Those guys really, Pat and, and Alan Freed especially, really key time for us to keep them. The plan for the rest of the year was for Pat and all of the starters to redshirt while John would coach a team full of backups. It would be the worst season in Oklahoma State history. Well, that was the year that we couldn't go to the Big 12 or NCAA championship. So, you know, we redshirted everyone and, and, uh, and we put a dual meet team out there, you know. Um, that a lot of people didn't think we should. We had four walk-ons that was starting that year. Five, five walk-ons that started this that year. And somewhere mid mid-season, we had to go pull someone out of Eskimo Joe's and that we knew wrestled because we had our, our 25 pounder that got injured. We had to pull them out of Eskimo Joe's and uh, train them up for a couple of weeks. And when they, they ended up starting for Oklahoma State in some dual meet. 
During the forgotten year, as it would come to be known, the Cowboys went 4-7, registering their first losing season since 1916. I got some um, pushback from from just losing a little bit, you know. Um, you know, people assuming that you should win everything, even uh, even <laughs> when you're when you got half a team, you know. So anyway, um, it was hard. It wasn't easy. Nobody was panicking. It was just like let's just get through this year. This is Mark Branch. He was a freshman during the forgotten season. Um, and be done with it and, and get ready to, to be back on top. I, and, and not, you know, I would, I would definitely say the mood was we're going to take basically an embarrassing year. And we're going to turn around next year and be in the mix. And, and I would even say a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence to, to be in the mix at the highest level, meaning I'm not going to say that we were sitting there going, we're for sure going to win it. But we knew, I think, in that room that we were going to be a team to contend with, that we could go, you know, win, win the NCAA title. As the 1993 NCAA tournament came and went, it marked the end of an epic saga for the Cowboys. An investigation that had spanned over three years and cost Josie his job was finally over. And Oklahoma State, was ready to reclaim their spot atop college wrestling. Led by their star, Pat Smith. He was about to re-enter the microscope, as everyone in the wrestling world, cowboy fans or not, were expecting him to win a fourth straight national title. There is pressure. Now you're starting to hear really after my freshman year and especially after my sophomore year you're starting to hear people you know coming and talking to you getting in your ear nearly every week saying you got to win four you got to win four well you you know you hear that every day the community okay wrestlers around the country hey you got to do this you got to win four our sport needs it our sport needs it i was listening to that a lot and i heard that a lot these guys were coming up to him going, hey, you got to do this, you got to win this, you got to, I mean, I, Oklahoma, not just Oklahoma State people, but anybody and everybody. So he had a ton, a ton of pressure on him to win. That was Pat's brother, Mark. Here's head coach, John Smith. You know, anytime anybody does something for the first time, you know, it's, it's you know, their experience is hard, especially when, when you're talking about doing something for the first time in the nation that no other athlete has ever done this. And you're getting attention beyond your normal attention, you know, and, and definitely Pat Smith was getting, you know, more calls, more, I mean, it was, it was a, a challenging year to keep it all in, all in control and keeping him in a good place. The quest for four national titles began with a road trip to Big Ten country as he and the Cowboys wrestled Penn State, the number one team in the land. Pat won easy, and the Cowboys upset the Nittany Lions to take over the number one national ranking. Pat returned to Stillwater to wrestle Oklahoma, their in-state rival, tallying another win. By February, he was undefeated and ready to wrestle in his last match at gallagher Iber Arena. It was senior night. And his opponent was the hated Iowa Hawkeyes. I just knew that I did not, did not want to get beat by an Iowa guy, nor was I ever going to get beat by an Iowa guy. That was in my head. And um, I am not going to let one of those guys ever in my career beat me. As Pat stepped on the mat that night, Dan Gable had a surprise for him. He pulled his prize prospect, Joe Williams, out of redshirt, and threw him to Pat Smith for his first collegiate match. Now, for those of you who don't know, Joe Williams is considered the best Illinois high school wrestler of all time. And in 2004, he'd go on to make the Olympic team. But during that night in February 1994, he was a true freshman, wrestling a grizzled vet in Pat Smith. Mark Branch was backstage warming up as the match took place. 
Um, that was the loudest I ever heard Gallagher. And I was in the back warming up. So I was behind the bleachers warming up. And I had my headgear on. And I'm back there just, you know, moving my feet, doing some stance in motion. And it kept getting louder and kept getting louder and kept getting louder. And it, it was like deafening to then I couldn't hear anything. And so, um, I, and meaning like, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it's kind of like if you shoot a gun and your ears are kind of ringing and you can't really hear anything. It, it got so loud that then it just got muffled. It was like just a hum and a buzz and I couldn't. And I was like, oh my God. Like I'd never heard anything like that. As Pat stepped onto the mat with the arena at a full roar, he put on a takedown clinic. Tech falling Joe Williams, the true freshman, in the first period. As the dual meet went on, Oklahoma State held on to beat Iowa 23-16, giving John Smith a win over the legendary Dan Gable, whose team was the three-time defending national champions. The redemption tour for Oklahoma State was in full swing. Cowboys, uh, they rallied around the flag. Um, they did a good job. Uh, they became one within the team, you know. Wrestling's a, uh, an individual sport, as we've always said before. But we can also see that how individuals, when they band together, what they can perform and what they can do in, uh, in desperate times, you know. And it, it, it looked after the national uh, sanctions against us and everything that the Cowboys might be hurting there for a while. After the Iowa meet, Pat finished the regular season undefeated for a third straight year and then went to the Big 8s, where he won a fourth Big 8 title, joining his brother Leroy, who also won four. He had two weeks until the 1994 NCAA Championships. The pressure was definitely building going into, going into the Nationals. Let's go from the two weeks on up, yeah. okay? Let's go from two weeks on up. The pressure was starting to build. Yeah, as it as it drew closer, it was a little bit tougher and a little bit more emotional. You know, um, it, I don't think he was enjoying it as much. You know, um, well, because I was ready for it to be over. I was ready to wrap it up. I think it became a, um, a scenario that this is what I have to do. You know, and that's the worst scenarios. You know, kind of, you know, I have to do this. Um, when it when it's when it gets away from you know the attitude I want to do this I'm gonna I, you know when you get anytime you get away from that attitude you know all of a sudden it's not enjoyable mm -hmm. right and so for the most part you know and even in my career you know I got to enjoy I want to do this for five of my six at the end I had to do it right and I think he felt the same and I think we all have to, I mean eventually you, you, that's where you go if you let pressure enter in right I mean and if you don't go there you ain't winning in addition to the pressure that Pat was feeling to win a fourth title he was also getting heat in his own wrestling room you see Mark Branch who had been Pat's workout partner for the past year and had taken beating after beating from Pat qualified for the Nationals with a losing record and in the days leading up to the tournament was going even with Pat Smith. They'd go some some live matches, wrestle a couple live matches, and I think Mark beat him a couple times, you know, for sure once, you know. And I, and I remember Pat taking off, running out the door, and, and was real emotional about it, and just you know, um, and I remember just kind of calming him down and going, "Listen, um, you're going to be fine," you know. And I think that experience for me in '92 helped me. Just reassuring that, listen, um, this is going to be fine, you know. Um, I think I said to him one time, hey, if you're going to pout about it, just remember, you don't have to win. And then he got all pissy and started cussing at me. <laughs> he was like, hey, you can choke and not win, you know, something like that, you know, and, and you know, we're all going to love you. Right. He was like, that wasn't going to work with him. <laughs> I didn't lose confidence like I think John thought I was losing confidence. I knew I had a different wrestler. And when I worked out with Mark after about two or three days of training with Mark, 
and going pretty even with Martin. And Mark's going pretty even with me. I mean, basically even. And he has a losing record. He has a losing record. And he's going even with me. All right? So we're in about two, three days of workout on the, in the two weeks before we go. And um, I walk up to John, and I told John, I said, that kid is going to win an NCAA title. John's like, really? You think so? I'm like, I don't think so. I know so. The Cowboys arrived in Chapel Hill, North Carolina on Tuesday, March 15th, 1994. Pat was ready to make history, and the team was ready to reclaim their spot atop college wrestling. If they did, it would be one of the biggest turnarounds in sports history. Keep in mind that just a year prior, Oklahoma State had gone 4-7 and seven and was barred from competing at the 93 Nationals. Wrestling that year took place at the Smith Center, named after legendary UNC basketball coach Dean Smith. But Cowboy fans took it as a sign, a good omen, if you will. Chuck White, Pat's brother-in-law, was there to watch. I think that was probably the biggest venue I'd been to a, a NCAA tournament at. And I mean, it was packed every every session. And I mean, it was, you know, loud. And everybody was, it was just a great tournament. Everybody was fired up, I think, for the tournament, you know, and won because a lot of great competitors, you know. And I think then there was a lot of anticipation with all the fans and whether or not, you know, Pat could become the first four-timer. On the night before the tournament started, Pat took a moment to reflect. I remember, you know, sitting in my room, um, you know, thinking to myself, you know, just one match at a time. Don't worry about the big picture. And I broke it down to where I didn't focus on, I didn't look, I, I tried not to look at any of it like, this is the NCAA championships, this is going for four, there's histories in stake, Okay, with all this, I didn't look at it like that. I couldn't. I looked at it as I'm going to wrestle five matches. I'm going to wrestle one match at a time. I'm going to wrestle this guy. Once I beat him, I'll mark him off, and I'll go to the next guy, and I'll focus on beating him. And I'm just going to wrestle one match at a time. And I remember telling myself always during that time that this is just another tournament. It's just another tournament. It's just called the NCAA tournament. The bottom line is, it's just another tournament. The next morning, Pat left his hotel room, arrived at the Smith Center, slipped on his Oklahoma State warm-ups, and readied for his last five collegiate matches. It was, you know, it was just like any of these other guys that are going for four national titles. Um you know, all eyes are on them. The talk is about them. Um, you know, um, it's it's the same thing. And, um, you know, I think there was a, l- a lot more pressure um, on me because I was, I was hitting uncharted waters. And it was all I could do to uh, stay calm, stay confident, get in my own head, okay, and take one match at a time. As the tournament started, Pat rolled through his first two opponents, Tech following the Kent State and Nebraska wrestlers. On Friday, he opened with a 14-3 major decision over Oregon State. And by Friday night, he won his semifinal about 6-2 and was headed to the finals. But maybe just as impressive was Pat's prediction about his teammate and workout partner, Mark Branch. In case you just joined us, the Cinderella story of this tournament for the Oklahoma State Cowboys, Mr. Mark Branch, the redshirt freshman from Newkirk. Mark Branch is believed to be the first uh, wrestler to make it to the NCAA Finals, and not only being an unseated wrestler, but to enter the tournament with a losing record. The next morning, Pat Smith awoke in his hotel room, which is 12 hours before the finals started. I, um... Got up that morning, and uh, Alan Freed and I went to the Waffle House to, because that's where he wanted to go, was the Waffle House. So me and Alan and um, 
Mark Branch went to the Waffle House. So we went there. And then, uh, Mark Branch, it, Mark Branch orders a, um, a bacon cheeseburger, a big bacon cheeseburger, huge with fries. And Freed says, are you going to eat that? Is that what you're going to eat the day of the NCAA tournament? And I looked at Freed and I said, Hey, Freed, leave him alone. That's the way he eats every day. And let's not. Let's not mess it up now. I said, just let him eat his bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> so uh, that's what we did that morning. We got up. We went to the Waffle House. And then later on, um, John and I went to the movies. We went to watch Red October. And uh, I was very relaxed. By 5 o'clock, it was time for Pat to head back to the Smith Center. It was time for the finals in his shot at history. Once I got into the into the tournament and everything, um, you know, I could feel the pressure. I, I mean, uh, you could feel the pressure. The pressure was there, and uh, you know, the pressure's there for all athletes in, in situations like that. Um, but like I said, um, I had to get in my head. I had to keep myself calm. I had to look at it as just another match, even though it wasn't. Back with you here from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Of course, Pat Smith of the Oklahoma State Cowboys bidding to become the first ever four-time NCAA champion. With just 10 minutes until the finals, Pat was in the tunnel pacing when he looked to his right and saw his opponent, Sean Barmet, lurking in the shadows, wearing the Michigan maize and blue. Pat's brother John walked up and whispered a few words of advice before Pat took the mat. You're getting ready to do something that's never been done, and, and there's a lot of attention on it. And um, Let's make sure you go out there and go for it, right? Mm-hmm. Let's leave nothing. I mean, you don't have to wrestle great and win this. I think I, I even said that to him. You know, we don't have to have the perfect match, okay? You're good enough to separate the score and win it when you have to win it, right? Um, and preparing him to win by one, you know, um, because it wasn't going to be much more than that. Pat Smith is going to be a man on a mission tonight. Watching right before the match, uh, John Smith and Mark Perry uh, giving him a little bit of a word of advice, and you could tell by the way that Pat Smith responded that uh, he means business tonight. And finally, it was time. Pat emerged from the tunnel, walked to the platform, stepped onto the mat, and waited. For his opponent. His opponent is Sean Borman out of Michigan. Borman, a senior from New Lenox, Illinois, the number two seed. He has a 1994 record of 33 and 1. Today, Sean Bormet is the head coach at the University of Michigan. But back in 94, he was a gritty senior, ready to ruin Pat's night. As Bormet stepped onto the stage, shook Pat's hand, the match started. After a minute of hard hand fighting, the first score happened. John Smith signaling to the uh, Cowboy fans, let's get on our feet and yell and scream for uh, Pat Smith. Cowboy fans over there holding up a uh, cardboard sign that says four in a row. Pat Smith scores a takedown here. Got in on that low, that patented low single leg. Got the ankle picked up and scores the takedown. Pat on top, two to nothing. The first period came to a close with Pat winning two to zero. And after a quick escape to begin the second, he was up three to zero. Mormon keeps slapping the head of uh, Pat, making sure he knows where Pat Smith is at. Pat, uh, of course, likes to get away from his bone. Doesn't like to be in those uh, tight, close, uh, close quarters. He likes the long range shots. You don't ever get the low single. Now Mormon's in on the single leg. Has the right leg picked up. Mormon. Has the leg picked up, drives Pat Smith to the mat with a takedown and drives him off the edge. One minute to go, second period. Sean Foreman of Michigan has scored the takedown. And uh, that makes it 3-2 to two as Foreman has scored the takedown. In a good match up here on the whistle, Pat Smith will score the escape. It's 4-2. to two. Pat yep. Smith doesn't seem to be moving and bobbing. He just seems to be standing right in front of uh, Foreman. There's a point for Borman. 
four to three is the score. They call double stalling there against Foreman and Smith, and the time runs out of the second period. With just two minutes until the end of the match, Pat was beginning to tighten up. And um, in the match, I can I can remember thinking to myself, just win. Just get your hand raised. And we're underway in the final two minutes. Pat Smith with a precarious one-point lead at 4-3 to three, is riding time at 109. Sean Borman of Michigan trying to pull off the big upset. Patty and on the single, switches off to a double leg. He's around behind Borman. No takedown yet. Borman turns, gets his hips down, gets off the edge of the mat, and no takedown. Pat got in there in good shape, but Borman, a great recovery, gets off the edge of the mat, no takedown. 123 to go, third period. Let's go, Sean. You can hear those chants in the background. Inside of a minute left, third period. Pat's going to have to uh, continue to be aggressive. They've already hit him with uh, a couple of stalling calls. 30 seconds to go. Borman shooting it underneath on the single leg. Pat getting his hips down, though, in good shape. Looks at the clock. 10 seconds to go. Pat Smith is five seconds away from becoming the first Division I wrestler to win four NCAA titles. Two. One. And that to do it is history. History, folks. Pat Smith had become the first four-time NCAA Division I wrestling champion. After the match, he put his warm-ups back on and stood atop the podium with the NCAA bracket in hand. The hardware is being passed out. But he wasn't the only cowboy to win a national crown that night. Senior Alan Freed won, as did Mark Branch. Match is over. Mark Branch of Oklahoma State, the red shirt freshman out of Newkirk, 8 and 9, coming into the tournament, unseated, obviously, and he goes all the way to the finals. Not only that, but he is the NCAA champion at 100. Despite having a losing record, Mark Branch won a title as a red shirt freshman. His win helped the Cowboys and John Smith win their first NCAA team championship since 1990, dethroning the three-time defending champs, the University of Iowa. Again, the Cowboys are the team champions, 30th time in school history. The Cowboys have done that. 94 three-quarter points for the Cowboys to 76 and a half for Iowa. The redemption tour was finally over. And the next day, Pat and the rest of the Cowboys returned to Stillwater. After that 94 season, Pat would wrestle freestyle a few more years before falling in the 1996 Olympic trial finals to fellow Cowboy Kenny Monday. After retiring from wrestling, Pat served as John's assistant coach for another decade, during which the Cowboys won four NCAA team titles. Today, Pat lives just outside Little Rock, Arkansas, and has been a key figure in creating high school wrestling as well as collegiate wrestling in the state of Arkansas. Pat's younger brother, Mark, who graduated high school in 1994 as one of the top wrestlers in Oklahoma history, went on to wrestle for John and Pat at Oklahoma State where he was a three-time All-American. Oldest brother, Leroy, served as the Arizona State head coach for the better part of a decade before taking up his current position as the executive director of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. And John? Well, he's still considered the greatest American wrestler of all time. And since that 94 season, He's gone on to lead the Cowboys to four more team titles. Today, he still coaches at Oklahoma State and is vying for yet another team championship. 
with so much winning and so many awards across the Smith family, it's no wonder why they're considered the first family in wrestling. And that's the end of this episode, as well as this series. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. It's been an incredible honor to produce this documentary. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you want to help us spread the word, please rate the episode and share it with your friends. The Smiths was written and directed by Ryan Warner. Executive producers include USA Wrestling and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. A special thank you to the entire Smith family, Rich Bender and Leroy Smith. Etched in Stone is an exclusive production of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and USA Wrestling. Download your free souvenir book of any of the Etched in Stone stories produced at nwhof.org. The storybook includes the written story and is filled with pictures and videos of their live matches. And while you're on the website, take a deeper dive into the profiles of the 179 distinguished members inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame.